Hello, I am Jolinda LeClaire, Director of Drug Prevention Policy for Vermont. I oversee the Governor's Opioid Coordination Council, which Governor Phil Scott established by executive order in January 2017. Since then, the Council has focused on its mission to improve Vermont's response to our opioid challenges through prevention, treatment, recovery, and enforcement. This crisis touches everyone in our state. Many Vermonters have family members and loved ones who have become addicted after receiving opioid prescriptions for pain. Others were exposed to opioids and other drugs through friends, dealers, and traffickers. Regardless of how they were exposed, we know we have among us many who now have the chronic, isolating, and too often deadly disease of addiction. We are making progress. Treatment is available across the state through Vermont's nationally known hub and spoke system of treatment. Recovery centers in our communities are providing effective wraparound support to help people achieve long-term recovery. Many communities are building prevention coalitions to provide our children and families the tools they need to be resilient in the face of life's challenges and traumas. Vermont law enforcement has steadily worked to increase community safety and to decrease the supply of illegal drugs. They also work hard to support prevention strategies that will reduce the demand for opioids. There is more we can do and must do to turn the curve on Vermont's opioid challenges. Drug prevention education is a top priority for schools and communities. Increasing intervention opportunities in emergency rooms and other places will help more people enter treatment and recovery. Individuals and families in recovery need support to obtain jobs and rebuild their lives, and support for harm reduction through safe and appropriate use and disposal of drugs and syringes will increase safety in homes and communities. Something we all can do to take every opportunity to raise awareness and reduce stigma by talking about addiction. To highlight the science of addiction, as well as the cultural, social, and economic challenges associated with addiction, the producers and hosts of Vermont Cable Access and the Opioid Coordination Council have created an eight-part series entitled Understanding Vermont's Opioid Crisis, Working Together to Create a More Resilient Community. The seventh in the series is about co-occurring disorders, substance use, and mental illness. Many people suffer from both substance use disorder and depression or other mental health challenges. In this segment, host Pat McDonald and her guests explore effective prevention and treatment strategies for people with such co-occurring issues. Well, thank you, Jalinda. Thank you for the introduction. Um, as Jalinda said, tonight we are talking about substance use disorders and mental illness, uh, co-occurring diseases, and the treatment available for those um, combination of disorders. And I have three pretty, I would call, experts tonight with me who are going to help us sort this all out. Sienna Fontaine, um, who is a licensed clinical social worker at the Howard Center. Yes. Welcome. Thank you. We usually shake, but you're so far away with three <laughs> guests. Mary Moulton, who's a repeat guest, is the Executive Director of Washington County Mental Health Services. Mary, okay. bye. Thank you. Um, and Rebecca Porter, who is a licensed alcohol drug abuse counselor from the Department of Mental Health. Is that correct? I got that yes. right. Yes, thank you. Thank you all for coming. So we always start out, as Mary knows, at talking a little bit about yourselves. So <laughs> I'll start with Reba. Okay, um, so my background is I'm um, dually licensed, which means that I have a license in addiction treatment as well as mental health treatment. Mm -hmm. um, and I currently work at the Department of Mental Health um, in the quality division, um, overseeing work at the designated agencies to ensure mm -hmm. um, certain quality standards uh -huh. for um, services and documentation of services. Mm -hmm. And my direct service background is um, in working with a variety of different populations. Um, I've worked with court-mandated individuals through the Department of Corrections, also incarcerated women, um, pregnant and parenting women who are working oh. towards reunification with um, their children or um, avoiding losing their children. Um, 
I've worked on inpatient psychiatry unit um, and street outreach and Goodness. crisis with children and families. So I've worked oh. quite a bit over the mm -hmm. whole I relate a little bit. Here. I'm on the Prevent Child Abuse Vermont board. Yeah. And oh, and and um, I was told the other day at a board meeting meeting that the numbers we were having them go down for child abuse, but now because of the opioid crisis. Their numbers are going up, but it's mostly because of neglect. Mm -hmm. Mary. Uh, well, uh, I'm the ex one of the designated agencies that Reba's watching all the time. <laughs> so I'm the executive director of Washington County Mental Health Services, and I've been at Washington County for about 27 years now. Um, started out as an emergency services clinician and worked with law enforcement uh, for years on a mobile crisis team um, and I did a stint at the Department of Mental Health after the flood <laughs> yeah. as the uh, deputy commissioner actually of uh, the Department of Mental Health and the acting commissioner for a period after that coming back to Washington County uh, as the executive director. So, Great. And we were glad you're back, Mary. Mary. Thank you, you know, I'm much. one of Mary's it biggest fans. <laughs> I make no bones about it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Sienna? So I am actually also duly licensed. Um, I'm a oh. licensed alcohol and drug counselor and a licensed independent clinical social worker. And I am another designated agency. So I work for the Howard Center in Burlington. It's a designated agency for Chittenden County. Great. And I do direct service for any adults in Chittenden County above 18 for both mental health and substance abuse. I do groups for recovery. And I do work with a mix of court mandated clients from um, the state government or from the federal probation office and clients who are self-referred. Oh, okay. Do they do these clients volunteer to come into your classes or do they Some, have to be referred? They uh, have to have an assessment and, yeah. and be referred oh, from okay. inside of our agency yeah. or referred from you know, mandated. Because I know Reba, they told me you were the only one who had the dual license in the You're in, in the department, yeah. so um, I thought it sounded like it was a unique thing, but I it didn't realize it that's is. great. I think in the Department of yeah. Mental Health, I do believe. Yeah, yeah, and I also think that across the state, the numbers I have are kind of old. I don't think mm -hmm. that they've changed much, but I think there are about 230 dually mm -hmm. licensed oh, clinicians really? in the well, whole state. Well, what a state. perfect time to mm -hmm. have the dual license because yes. sadly, Yes. It's a huge issue. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think some people probably specialize in one and stay on yes. that track. Right. Yes. But as we know, they're not disconnected. No, I don't know right. how you can separate them, which is what we're talking about right. tonight. Yeah. So tell me a little bit, in your job, um, you do you weigh in, like if, if you see something in one of Mary's files and you say, Mary, maybe this person should be um, sent to for, for further uh, evaluation or something, is that what happens? Um, yes, we actually, we, um, the Department of Mental Health designates certain agencies, which are community mental health centers across the state. So um, in each part of the state, there's a designated agency um, that provides mental health services, and those funds, Medicaid funds, flow through the Department of Mental Health to each of those agencies. And then the, the Department of Mental Health is tasked with overseeing um, documentation standards and clinical care standards. Um, and so I work as part of a quality team and we go around the state and we review clinical documentation and we also talk to um, different people at the agencies, including like the board of directors, but also um, clients and family members uh. to learn about what their experiences are at the agency. Um, so the chart review part is where we really look at the clinical documentation and we see like one of the standards is that we want to make sure that um, each person is screened for substance abuse treatment, even though we're mm -hmm. overseeing mental health. Mm -hmm. But the, that's so integral, in, integral to people's treatment to not miss that, right. to make sure that's being assessed. So screening, and then if there's a positive screening, which means that there's a reason to believe the person might have a problem, then... Mm -hmm we would um, want to see evidence that that was followed up on in the chart, and then right. the treatment plan would include information about how it's gonna be addressed. So you're looking at a patient coming in, your, your right. folks are, I, I don't know how much one-on-one -on -one you do with the folks, probably not so much in your job. 
in my job as executive director, well, we have so many doors that mm -hmm. people come through, right. Pat. So, um, you know, having adult, adult and children's outpatient right. services and um, an emergency services team, yeah. um, certainly people with developmental disabilities, who we are also seeing an increase in, by the way, of using substances. Oh, really? So, um, so we're we're we're. Uh, having what we're working on in our region overall is just making sure we have no wrong door and Washington County Mental Health is one of the doors yeah. that people come through. I like that analogy than some of the other ones we've used over the past. It seems more open and friendly, just pick a door. Pick a door. Pick if a you door. go into the Turning Point Recovery Center, we want to make right. sure in our region that you know uh, or they know who to refer to um, or if they come into our door, if they go into a primary care practice if they in, go into this Central Vermont Substance Abuse right. Services door. And um, in our region, Central Vermont Substance Abuse Services mm -hmm. is a preferred provider. So along the Department of Mental Health um, is right. designates us and the um, Alcohol and Drug Abuse Program, right. Right. ADAP, right. designates the Central Vermont Substance Abuse Services versus Sienna might talk about right. Howard where they are both mm -hmm. a designated agency and a preferred provider. Mm -hmm. So Okay, so tell us what a preferred provider is because I actually embarrassingly don't know and I'm ashamed <laughs> to say yeah. that. So what is a preferred provider versus a designated agency? Do My understanding yeah. right, is that we cannot turn anybody away. Oh. So if someone comes to us for an assessment, if they don't have any insurance or don't have the funds to pay for it, that ADAP, as mentioned, will cover the cost of I the see. assessment and the treatment. For yeah. substance abuse. And that's under the designated agency umbrella or the preferred, preferred, preferred provider. provider. So ADAP has abuse. preferred <laughs> providers and the Department of Mental Health designates agencies as like community oh, mental health Oh, that center. makes sense. Yeah. I get it. I see. Yeah. Right. Thank you. right. So we divide yeah. it by county. So if I have yeah. someone coming in from Virgins, I will refer them back to their county for services. Oh, I see. Oh. If they're if they're billing under Medicaid or Medicare right. or ADAP. Yeah. Okay. So could you talk just quickly about Howard Mental Health? Um, we've never had anyone on the show mm -hmm. from your agency, and we got. I think people uh, know where Mary's from, but we had Dr. Brooklyn, I believe. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, Dr. Brooklyn you. is somewhat involved in yeah. us through the yeah. hub and spoke model at the Chicken yes, Clinic, which we've talked about a lot. Correct. Yeah. The Howard Center is vast and broad across Trenton County from developmental services, children's services, emergency services. We have um, advanced inpatient services, a lot of hospital diversion programs for crisis, job training. We, have, we are involved in the Centerpoint School for teenagers who have co-occurring disorders. Right. We have our outpatient facility, street outreach team, psychiatry, group homes. Wow. So mm -hmm. it's okay. You mentioned about co-occurring. Mm -hmm. What group was that that you were talking about? Uh, for adolescents. Oh, adolescents. Yes. Because I know Jolinda would very much like us at some point in the show to talk about the youth mm -hmm. and what's happening mm -hmm. with the young people, which apparently isn't good, right? If numbers are increasing and mm -hmm. everything. I have right. to say, I had that, uh, the, I worked for the Merchants Bank years mm -hmm. ago, and they used to hire cleaning help from the mm. Howard as a training model yes, and it was so that. cool because mm -hmm. I always work late something's wrong with me I know <laughs> but, um, and they would come up and clean and, and yeah. some of the clients were just so charming they were it was a great um, mm. I felt good that they were doing it and they were yeah. learning how to uh, have some skills and that yes. was a good thing yeah it was a good thing so um, I, I hate to stick to go to relapse right away but mm -hmm. I when when we were talking about that must be something you're obviously fighting against but it's almost it just happens doesn't it and is there a way to to make the if they're going through all of this issue with both mental health and mm -hmm. and rehab how do you i mean just to get one under control must be um a godsend it must be feel like you won something because the the turmoil for the person mm -hmm. i was sitting i'm thinking if you have a mental health disorder and opiate I mean, the constant yin and yang and pulling, I mean, how, how do they not relapse? How is that for a question? <laughs> well, I think it's not uncommon for people to have a co-occurring mm -hmm. mental health issue yeah. at the same time that they have a substance use issue that they're struggling with. Um, I think it's one in five people 
um, experiences a mental health issue. Um, I mean, in the population? Mm -hmm. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's pretty common. Depression and anxiety are mm -hmm. common um, issues that can be short-term or more long-term <clears throat> for people to struggle with. And um, I think part of it is being able to recognize the whole person. And you were talking about no wrong door. Mm -hmm. And similarly with a person, it's a whole person. And if you do a good clinical assessment and That's right really identify what's going on, then you can more effectively treat the whole person. Right. The anxiety issue and the alcohol issue may be connected where a person gets anxious and they drink and they feel calm. Right. And, and so that's a coping skill they develop, which ends up causing a lot of problems and can lead to death. Um, but just working on these things together and also giving people information about kind of why they're doing some right. things that they're doing, which they may not even be aware of. Yeah. Does information to the client help? Uh, I mean, when, they, uh, when you really sit and talk to them, and I'm sure you're probably open and honest with them and tell mm -hmm. them, here's where you're at. Um, I just, because I think information is important to these people that they can digest it, that yeah. uh, understands what's going on, help them a little bit to to balance it is, do you do that a lot? Focus on, the, on information and telling them what's wrong? Yes, I, I like to be as transparent as possible. Yeah, so I like to good. openly talk about diagnoses and they're involved in their treatment plan process. So, oh, they are? You know, what, what concerns do they have? What are their goals? You know, how are we gonna get there? Oh, how great. do we know we're there? Which we, you know, check in on periodically. Yeah. And I believe with what we have to approach is, you know, with opiates that relapses do happen mm -hmm. and normalizing and validating from a strengths-based perspective. Mm -hmm. And yet the trick with opiates is that the relapses can be fatal. And so you're working to do you know, maybe a harm reduction approach and also preventing relapse while also allowing them to really accept their process of recovery and develop self-compassion and not judgment. Right, right. Do you have a lot of group peer um, groups where peer help, peer on peer help and support. Because I had a discussion last week um, with the doctors, and they were saying how that really it's works valuable. when you're talking to somebody who may not have this even the same mental health issue or uh, level of, of addiction, but mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. still good to talk to somebody that maybe understands. I, I think it's important to have options. For people, I always say it's different strokes for different right. folks. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, as a systems person, I'm here with two excellent <laughs> clinicians. Yeah. I'm more of a systems person, and so, um, you know, what we try to do is make sure that yes, we have uh, we, we have referrals to peer groups. So we could suggest oh. people go down to the recovery center, um, seek out a 12-step program. Mm -hmm. Um, we have the best practice within our Central Vermont Addiction Medicine program of, of therapy with the medication, medication assistant treatment mm -hmm. so that we couple the medication with the therapy. That's very oh, important yes. because that's where you mm -hmm. work on those, the, the harm reduction, right. the coping strategies, the so skills building. It's up to the individual building. what they're comfortable with. It's, that's an yeah. important combination. Yeah. And then... Um, you know, even as, as we've looked at kind of prevention in our agency, uh, Pat, we think about things like mindfulness. We mm -hmm. think about things like AccuDetox, which is an acupuncture um, oh. process of putting, um, you know, needles in one's ears. Right, right. And some people feel a real stress reduction. It helps them to cope yeah. better. So we actually offer some of these what we call complementary right therapies. Right in our facility? Within our facilities oh, nice. at different times so that... Folks can tap into different methods to help them to cope right. mm -hmm. um, and reduce their stress. Because yeah. as Reba was saying, you know, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? I'm right. highly anxious. I'm going to take a drink. And um, you know, so we we want to be having some different methods for people to be tapping into. Yeah. So how when I walk in the door and um, I've been referred from my doctor, how do you assess? where I'm at in that co-occurring disorder thing. How you must have, how do you do that? I'm just going to mm -hmm. keep quiet and let you answer. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, you, you see the well, papers coming in, right? Yes, and I think that they're pretty um, 
similar mm -hmm. across the designated agencies. And I think that's because there's a pretty um, clear list of ingredients of what should be included in um, a full comprehensive assessment. And that's things like um, family situation, like support. legal situation, work history, educational history, um, current functioning, um, trauma screening, um, and um, ASM. Yeah, addictions related mm -hmm. yeah. assessment. Okay. So when they've come to you though, the doctor that sent them has said, we think we've got two things going on here, or maybe they're not so sure, because I mean, you guys have, have dual licenses. Do you train your people that you work with, as staff, to how to identify? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe they're, they're specialized mm -hmm. in mental health, but how do they pick up on the addiction? That seems to me to be pretty complicated, how to balance. Do you train people in your organization of how to, yeah. how to identify it and then what the heck yeah. to do with it? Because... Yeah, I mean, all of our initial assessments are a comprehensive mental health and substance abuse assessment. Right, yeah. So even if someone's coming in saying, you know, I have a lot of depression, I'm asking them, you know, when's the first time you've used alcohol in your mm -hmm. life? How many drinks do you drink? You know, how often? And we go through screening criteria for every person. Right. Uh, the only difference is if I know they're already coming in f primarily for a concern of substances, I'll have them do a urine analysis test, right. um, but I can tack that on if I'm picking up that that's also very present in an assessment. Yeah. But we ask the same questions. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we have a single point of contact mm -hmm. at Washington County Mental Health, and the person that does that intake, our intake coordinator, mm -hmm. is dual licensed. Oh, no kidding. So, you know, that, that so is able, but, but it is about content experts. Mm -hmm. It's about having a yeah. Sienna or a Reba who can then share information with those who might not have that dual license. Yep. And there's a supervision process within all of our agencies yes. mm -hmm. where um, you have individual supervision. In fact, to get a license, you have to have the supervision. There's required hours. But after that, oh. you have ongoing supervision with clinicians, and sometimes we have, we have an, a group supervision mm -hmm. um, where you, know, you are gaining from uh, many clinicians around the table. Right. And that is a regular part of our practice within designated agencies. Yeah. Do you have uh, your clinicians sitting around talking about a patient and mm -hmm. back Doing and forth it, yes. about what's, what's the best course of treatment here? And they, mm -hmm. they, they, they could be bringing up a case yep. to share, yes. Oh, okay. yeah. And how often do you see these people? Because I would think addiction needs to be constantly monitored and because you can fall pretty mm -hmm. quickly. Mm -hmm. Do, do you have them come in every day or? Well, one of the nice things about the assessment is that we get to gauge, you know, what is their level of care? So if they need intensive outpatient, which we call IOP, they're gonna come in three times a week for three hours each day in a group setting. Oh. It's nine hours. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be our level before an inpatient stay or going to Valley Vista or calling the Brattleboro Retreat or any other rehab facility. Yeah. I have a group that meets once a week for an hour and a half, oh. and those are for people who have periods of sobriety behind them, want to stay engaged in their sobriety, maybe find that more helpful than a group meeting in the community, yeah. and just need extra skill work and processing. So are you a residential facility at Howard when you said in, do people stay overnight there? Or? No, so, so our intensive outpatient, the IOP, yeah. is, is outpatient. Is outpatient they're coming, right. Yep, they're coming in, they're sitting yeah. in a room for three hours. And they're headed home. And mm -hmm. So sometimes when you do an assessment, um, you find that the person needs a level of care that maybe the organization that mm -hmm. you work right. for can't mm -hmm. provide. Mm -hmm. So then you would refer them um, to an inpatient or oh, right. residential okay. rehabilitation right. And that's the program. ones that you yeah. mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. yeah, those yeah. are the ones in Vermont now right. that Maple Leaf isn't yeah. open. And yeah. I, I thought that for a while there, the, the beds were a little Yes. Were we talking about that at some point, Mary? Where we were? Where do these folks go? Well, um, have we fixed for that both psychiatry yes. and substance yes. yeah. and use treatment? We had, uh, yeah, we had Maple Leaf close, and right. so we lost those beds. Yeah. There's conversation now going on about adding some beds on, and, and so. some beds were added in Virgins, I believe. Yes. 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 Yeah. For, yes. yeah. Because I think it would be harder for these people for to women. be away from their mm -hmm. family. Yeah, I'm sure different. if they've got a supportive family, it's helpful mm -hmm. for them yeah. to see family members on a, on a regular basis. Right. So um, 
I, I found a list of uh, treatment uh, strategies, and uh, some of them we've already talked about, but I, I thought one of them was educating and counseling for families. So you must reach out to the families of these people too. Is that part of the treatment for I walk in and I need help? And do, you, do the families get help on how to deal with me? Or wow. <laughs> there's this help. whole thing called confidentiality. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I so that have, depends. Right. I will yeah. have okay, um, that's interesting. partners come into yeah. a session sometimes. So it might look more like a couples counseling session, yeah. but we do offer some psychoeducation, some general information about the substances, maybe withdrawal, mm -hmm. okay. relapse. Right. Uh, we do have a family support group okay. at yeah. the Chittenden Clinic yeah. for families who have children or spouses or relatives who are dealing with an opiate addiction. Um, but that is kind of on a different, you know, yeah. voluntary level. Because in Prevent Child Abuse Vermont, they have a lot of parent sessions mm -hmm. where parents, and maybe that's the place mm -hmm. where they could get, you know, how to, how to yeah. help because I, I would think it would be difficult to know how to respond to a loved one mm -hmm. who's home and struggling. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it would be ideal. Yeah. Um, what I do see most often is that the home life and the family life may not be healthy. Right. Well, and that's the so way you're it's navigating a lot of that as well in recovery. Right. Yeah. And yeah, and you're not dealing with the whole family system when you're mm -hmm. dealing with one individual. I definitely saw that um, when I did um, crisis work with children and families. Right. Sometimes there would be an identified sick person, and um, then everything became that sick person's, for lack of a better word, fault. Yeah. Um, right. When clearly there were family dynamics sure. where everybody mm -hmm. was involved mm -hmm. in some kind of Right. Situation. So now yeah. we're faced with this opioid crisis, and I'm sure for years you were mentioning alcohol and drugs, and that's always been an addiction. And now and we've got this opioid crisis, so you've probably had to make some changes to, to react to mm -hmm. this new lovely crisis of ours, and it is everywhere. It is. It, it I really mean, it's just is. everybody it's I really talk is. to, it's scary. I mean, having, you know, been in this field for 27 years, I have to say, I remember when it was heroin was hitting the streets right. in certain places, right. and then right. it was coke yep. for a while, and it was always alcohol, and it's yep. still alcohol. Mm -hmm. We cannot forget that right. we have yeah. a significant right. issue with alcohol in, in Vermont and else and throughout the nation. But this one is, is, is really pronounced, and, and I have to say that um, folks that run my programs have said they have not seen it so bad really? effect on children you mentioned mm -hmm. yes Pat. right and um, Could you expand on that a sure little bit? I mean we have we also have a, a, a school that right. we run we right. have interventionists in all of our schools and they certainly uh, in er, from early childhood on through high school are seeing children come in um, with more trauma mm -hmm. um, certainly the neglect is prevalent um, Parents are not as responsive if they if they have have if they have an opiate addiction, um, perhaps not as present right. and that's for where that, that child. Neglect issue comes and in. that's where the neglect issue yeah. comes in. So we're um, to say nothing uh, uh, about um, per, a mom who is going through addiction while she is in utero with a child, you know, oh. being pregnant, and um, oh, then there may be children. attachment issues. Yes, so. These things we're all seeing that, you know, certainly within our children's division, um, they've brought up uh, great needs for more child care, yeah. more wraparounds for mm -hmm. parents, more education, more intervention and support. Yeah. And so um, just, just in the family side and the child side, that's yeah. really pronounced. And emergency services uh, has definitely seen an escalation in people that they're screening right. um, that have a co-occurring, uh, you know, drug use right. uh, situation That's going. Sad. On. Yeah. Oh well, especially when you're born with yeah. that addiction. I mean, the poor poor baby hasn't done anything except be born. Well, and I just want to say, too, that I have seen a lot of really amazing recovery happen. Oh, good, good um, news. Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, good. You know, working with pregnant and parenting women at Lund Family Center, I think there was a time when nobody was identified um, as having any kind of drug or alcohol problem mm -hmm. at Lund Family Center. Um, and 
when I worked there in from like 2005 to 2007, it was rare to have someone come who who didn't have some kind of family struggle of some sort right. or wasn't affected themselves. And I worked with a lot of really amazing, resilient women right. who loved their children and with the proper um, treatment and being treated with respect. I was gonna say a little self-confidence probably. Yeah, and also having um, a, a safe place to live right. with their child, right. yes. um, adequate food, um, and all of the basic human right. needs would be met and then you would watch people kind of thrive and flourish and become That's these great. like amazing That'll moms. That'll make you feel good. Yeah. Well, we talked about the potential for maybe safe baby courts, um, mm. which we don't have in our region. What is a but, safe baby well, court? Well, if, if a mom um, is in danger of um, seeing her parental rights terminated, oh. that the court will actually bring in the supports and begin to help that person nice. in a more uh, planful way mm. toward recovery to give them the opportunity to reestablish disruption, right. yeah, right, and so we don't have that in my region, but um, certainly something that my clinicians have talked about would be just yeah, but such it's a elsewhere tremendous in the, asset in the country, it in is. other states. Yeah, it's called Safe nice. Baby Court, mm. and it's had that kind of success, and I would love yeah, to yeah. see it. I don't know if Burlington has it, Sienna, but we um, we used to have more programs for women uh, through the hospital and. Um, a lot of children would be born, and we put on Suboxone or methadone, yeah, right, right, to right. wean off and detox. Um, I think that some of the funding or some of the programs have oh, shifted. Really? Um, I've worked with many women and men who have been TPR'd or had their parental rights terminated yep. by DCF for substance use related mm -hmm. reasons, and I have worked with couple of women who regained custody. Right. Um, so it's the we've tried exception. to push that, I think, in Vermont, where the, right. the best place for the child is with a functioning family. Yes. Right, and it, mm -hmm. but it can take a lot of wraparound yeah. services, yeah. especially for a single mother or right. single father um, to regain custody. And it is, it's a fight. And it, and must it be is hard. amazing to see when it happens. It must be yeah. hard for all these people going see. through treatment yes. to retain their job. Because mm -hmm. if they're at your place for nine hours <laughs> a week, that's oh, sort of tough yes. on the employment Completely. part of things. Yes. Right. So it really takes the community to understand right. and employers to understand and really honor that. Yeah. Do people. you work with employers to explain the situation or, or to somebody? It, it's, to, I mean, I really try to protect everyone's confidentiality. Oh, okay. So unless, oh. they, unless they sign forms and want me to talk mm -hmm. to their yeah, employer. Right. Yeah. But, but there's a lot of vulnerability in sharing a story like that yes. because there's still a lot of stigma and a lot of judgment. Right. Yeah. And if a client is advocating for that and wants us to be a part of that, mm -hmm. we are more than willing. Right. Um, but they have to be the one to drive that direction. Right. Because I think uh, we had a methadone clinic open up here in Berlin, and we have another one at the hospital, and I forget what that mm -hmm. drug, uh, the... Suboxone? Uh, I think Is that... that my, yeah, buprenorphine. buprenorphine. Mm -hmm. But I, yeah. when we were opening up that methadone clinic, I was blown away by who came to me and said, my son, my daughter, yeah. people... I think that's what's the most surprising. in the community, mm -hmm. and, you know, letters after their names and degrees and yes. and they said please please open this up because my son or daughter is driving right. with the kids to Burlington yes. to um, down in New Hampshire somewhere and uh, and I've, I've never never broken their confidentiality but I was just amazed mm -hmm. I knew at who mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. I had a friend actually when I was a teenager before methadone came to Vermont and he lived in the Chittenden County area and he was so ill with mm, heroin addiction really? and his mother would drive him every day to yep. Greenfield, Massachusetts. Oh, I remember when it was in Greenfield. It was an eight yeah. hour round trip yep. Yep. and he that. would not be alive today if it wasn't wow. for that and I remember when Thanks, um, methadone came to Vermont I was so excited I went mm -hmm. to the, like the press release right. conference. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well it was um, well accepted in our town and yeah. these because the, good. the people the, the, the women with their children would drive at some ridiculous hour mm -hmm. to get to work and to get the kids to school in time so that they retained their jobs. So they'd be driving to Burlington at four and five right. in the morning yeah. to 
get the treatment and then get back to work. Mm -hmm. So oh, yeah. anyway, so uh, um, Sienna, we were talking about, um, um, I, don't know, I can't explain this. How do you manage to keep people moving forward? Um, because it, oh, you look at it, it's like, what do you, how do you keep no, them going? that's a good question. Because I mean, yeah. all I keep thinking is you've got all these things in your head happening, your mental illness and then the desire for drugs and somebody's telling you fix this and don't do this. And mm -hmm. how do you keep them going? And, and because, I, I don't know, I'm sure they have an, an idea, though, in a couple of months I'll be good as new, but I don't think so. I think mm. this is a lifelong yeah, Life yeah, that mix of commitment, incredible hope mm -hmm. that we retain, and and realism, and being you know very valid about that fact that it's going to be something that they're going to think about and they're going to want to think about for the rest of their life, right? right? If they want to maintain sobriety, if that's their goal, and you know we can't separate out a mental illness and a substance use disorder just as they can, right? So the treatment of them l looks very similar. Mm -hmm. You know, we're working on healthy coping skills, we're working on daily goals, we're working on small goals. So right. we can't, right, we can't climb Everest without figuring out like, where is it? Right. What do I need to buy? Right. How do I train? And so we, we want to have the gratification of getting to a small step. But we want to have, you know, the longer goal right. in mind, yeah. and you know, it's we can maintain support and hope. Do and they go? Is there always psychiatric treatment involved in whatever is happening here? Do no. they get? They no. That surprised me. There's, there's not. They don't talk to somebody who's a psychiatrist who could help them or. Our psychiatrists do medication and medication management. Yeah. So the bulk of your counseling is gonna be with your therapist. Oh, right? I see. Your counselor, oh, okay. your oh, okay. mental health counselor, yeah. social worker. You know, we, we throw all these terms around, yeah, but okay. this, yeah, the overarching thing is, yeah, would be with your, so your therapist So at what point do they leave the Howard Center and you say, good luck, or do they never leave? It really depends. I mean, I work with a lot of people who are on pretrial or probation. Uh -huh. um, so I have some people who leave because they need to start their sentence. Right. You know, ah. and so they're going to leave because. And I hear corrections is not a as well yes. as it could be in uh, support. It, it <laughs> I do hear it's trying to get better, um, yes. but you know, or you know, some people move or you know change counties. You know. I, it is amazing when we have people who do complete treatment, and we do. The reality of addiction is that a lot of times you lose a client because mm -hmm. they stop coming. Right. And they don't call back. And you right. may never know. And you may never know. What happens. Yes. And yeah. yeah, I mean, I've worked at Howard Center for three years, but it's long enough for me to see people come back. Sure. Yeah. Right? Sure. And, you know, they're, they're always changed. And so... There's, yeah, there's a million ways to come in and there's a million ways to kind of leave the agency. Yeah, but, it's the same of you, Mayor, what your experience has been with um, how do you keep them? Well, you know, I, th encouraged, I, th um, I think with addiction and mental, um, mental health challenges, it's, it's a waltz. It's, it's, you know, sometimes two steps forward and one, one back, step right. back. And um, however, people do recover and that it is all about the hope. And, you know, I think the other part of it is um, uncovering the the stigma of coming forward and asking for help. Right. You know, we know that it is something that's affecting families um, everywhere, whether it's alcohol, whether it's opiates. And so when one needs help to come forward, I'm really impressed, for example, by the airport in Burlington. Yes. And the wonderful messaging that has been put forth on the... What's happening the, there? Well, it's the, it's the messages on the windows as you walk really? by to about come into the airport. And, recovery. Yeah. and it's all about addiction and recovery. And mm -hmm. there's an ongoing video mm -hmm. of people speaking about their recovery, yeah. about how they came forward to get help, about how you can make it and it can make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, and so the messages are written and they're quotes from people. Oh, yeah. It's an encouragement yeah. Um, and it's around the opiate crisis, yeah. but it's an encouragement nice. to get the help you need. And that's yeah. the kind of messaging we need to have in our communities right. throughout because yeah. we can't pretend this is not happening. And um, I think, 
you know, even when people die, and obituaries actually say mm -hmm. now that right, this person right. died right. of an overdose, right. an accidental overdose. I mean, that's part of families, I think, coming to grips with mm -hmm. wanting to make a change right. for someone else. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, that's, that's re reducing the stigma and saying enough of this that's with great. mental illness or with substance use. Let's stop this nonsense. Right. This is health. This is about taking care of ourselves. Right. And we absolutely should encourage people right. to come forward. Right. And it's about how we create a healthy community so we, yeah. don't, we don't have people feeling left out yeah. that I they can be that part was, of. Uh, at the, uh, you know? This is such a long title. At the Opioid Awareness Something Day at the State House recently. Yeah. That was a, it's like a title about 10. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, there was a young woman there who spoke before the commissioners and after and the, and the governor was there. And she told her story. Oh, mm -hmm. so powerful. It was amazing. And she's very attractive, very young and, and articulate. And she is now a counselor. Mm -hmm. She's completely, Great. her family, that we got the kids back. And, and right. the story was just, there was, I don't think there was a dry eye in the yeah. Cedar Creek room. It was powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, you know, amazing. to extend that though, I, I do feel like it's all of ours to educate. Because what I find is so often that burden of the message falls on the person yeah. Yeah. who experienced the addiction or the illness. Right. So I always invite everyone to it's talk about it. Right. You know, and if you know, you know, someone in your family, you know, obviously protect you know their story, but but be open about it and, and ask questions and, and support them and talk about it. Right. Mm -hmm. That's great. There, we've talked about, I mean, I'm sure homelessness, incarceration. I wanted to do a show on corrections, but I was looking into it. I don't think their, their program there is as full and encompassing as it, as it should be. So um, I think when they come out, there's probably more issues than when they went in, right? I think opioids sort of How makes you, you feel right. good for the moment, right? Yeah. Right. Right. Or it allows you to keep working. Yeah, you know, right. If, you have chronic if you're pain, in pain. Oh. Yeah. You know, it can allow some people who do very labor intensive jobs to keep working so right. they can buy the groceries and yeah. Mm -hmm. so or they're like, yeah. I can't take two weeks off to, to completely detox and withdrawal at home. I have to go to work. Right. And, yeah. you know, and so that keeps them in that cycle just so they feel like they can function. Yeah. So do you deal with young people a lot in, in Howard Mental Health? Uh, like, I, I, I personally, know, what's young, yeah. under 18 um, I personally teenagers? don't do direct service with anyone under but, 18, but we do offer those do. services. Yeah. Um, but I will have 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds yeah. in my groups. Because we have, have very high people. suicide rates. Mm -hmm. One of the highest in the country in teenagers. Is that um, an accurate... I think I'm right on that, but I heard that somewhere. That we're, we're, we're seventh in the nation oh, for a suicide overall. rate overall. Oh, overall? Yes, overall. Oh. I don't know what the breakdown well, even that's of sad in the that 10. age group is, yeah. but um, it, that is a very sobering yes, that number. Is. And we really need to, um, we need to work on that. Right. And that, I think, is part of the stigma mm -hmm. because... Um, the uh, we are actually rated for access for mental health care as number one wow. by some by by the National um, Institute of Mental Health, but we are seven. That's strange. In, then. So what, if we have so much access, it's about it's a it, you know it makes one question. What is that about? Is it about our messaging? Is it about you know people not coming forward right. for They're help hiding. when They're they hidden. when they might need it. Right. Um, so while we have access, not enough because we certainly have issues around that, right. but this is in comparison, and we all know nationally right. there's a lot of problems with access. So, right. you right. know, what does that mean that we're number one? Well, there, it doesn't mean stigma, tremendously well, great. Well, you said that we, we're getting better <laughs> on stigma, but I have a feeling that we That's have still a long a way to go. Yes. Mm -hmm. If people, if we have all the services, mm -hmm. which, thank God, we're in Vermont, but it's not getting to the people that need it. Maybe it is a stigma thing. Well, or people don't, yeah, people, oh, people don't, don't come, come yeah, forward don't feel comfortable for it. Though. And so how do we make access right. to our services something that's hmm. more comfortable, more inviting? Primary care offices, right. having screenings for suicide is very important. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that is a significant factor that mm -hmm. we need to have more mental health um, screening within right. primary, primary care. care. So we're working on that as right. a state. Yeah. 
and getting better and so better at it. Do you have a lot of young people in, in your um, group of clients? Yes, within our group of clients. And have yeah, gotten certainly. higher well numbers? Over, so. Yep. Yep, well over a thousand, and um, so, the, but that's for you know mental health treatment, and I couldn't right. tell you sitting here what, you know, what the screenings have been on, oh. um, on on substance use. Uh, certainly, these kids but have had there. tremendous trauma. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because and it is so, so available in the yeah. schools. Um, when I did the law enforcement uh, segment, they were telling me how available things are. Right. Sure. Yeah. And a lot of kids have access to money, so. If that's yeah. not a problem. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. Anyway, so what do you see in your in your records when you're dealing a lot of children all over? Because you look statewide. Um, I mostly so. focus on adult oh, do you? services. Yeah. Um, we do have a children's division, uh -huh. and I have um, participated in just one chart review um, with them. And you do see um, kids, like Mary was saying, with significant trauma histories sometimes substance abuse issues of their own. Um, certainly they all have mental health issues, right. which is why we're, right. they, we're, they have yeah, a chart. Right. Right. Um, but certainly um, family dynamics. And yeah. Well, I like the focus on like alternative treatments you yes. were mentioning, mm -hmm. acupuncture, yeah. massage yeah. must be one of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sign me yeah. up for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that Anything to relax people and to make them feel safe. And well, and connection, Pat, I think, yes. uh, you know, one of the questions that's on the Vermont Department of Health Youth Risk Survey yeah. is whether youth feel connected mm -hmm. to their communities. And the number is not great there. And again, I'm not going to remember it exactly, yeah. but what the point is, is, um, you know, we are in, a, in our region in Washington County, we have developed what we call an accountable community for health. And that's providers from all different human services coming together right. to talk about how we address food insufficiency, right. how we address mental health, how we address housing and those other social determinants of health, and how we help people feel a part of their community. And we, we get off on these talks. One was, you know, um, uh, in Iceland, for example, mm -hmm. kids go to school for a half a day and they are required to have a hobby. Required, out. and we couldn't really? do that awesome. here. Yeah, no. But you know, you know, people that were sitting in this group were like, "Aha!" Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, a mm -hmm. sense of belonging, a right. sense of learning, mm -hmm. of participating. How do we, you know, our schools do some of that? You mm -hmm. have to do like right. a a capstone project before you can graduate, which is about volunteering in your community. Yeah. How do we do more of mm -hmm. that? It helps to enrich life, yeah. teach skills. Well, it gives skills. them a buy-in into their community. Absolutely, mm -hmm. which, which, helps, which is an asset yeah. to help you when you're faced with high-risk behaviors. Right. And I think that's true. Um, that's another big piece of peer recovery, um, self-help mm -hmm. groups yeah. and um, other self-care activities like yoga yes. centers. Yeah. I yeah. think um, there's, there's a lot of mindfulness and also... Um, body focus that happens there that uh, really seems to help That's people great. be grounded and get out of their heads a little bit in a way of being here now in the present moment. I don't mean to be sexist here, but I mean, how do you, I'm just thinking of my husband. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I mean, he has a... Okay, Bruce. Wait. Yeah, I know exactly. He doesn't watch this. He has a built-in, you know, no yoga, no, no massage. But I think they would be a little difficult to get to relax unless they're really, whatever you say, I'll do. But I think they might be a little hard to... You know, I think that to goes to enough. the different strokes for different yes, folks. And yeah. so it might be that someone would prefer exercise, really, mm -hmm. you okay. know, really getting out for right. a run. Team sport. Right. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Team sport. Doing some woodworking. So it really is knitting. individual. Yeah. Individual you know, programs. knitting is, yeah. is, yeah. is uh, you know, one of Reba's great, great hobbies. And yes. I'm sorry you didn't so, bring it. <laughs> so, so, you know, I mean, these are the things that, whether it's gardening, I love to do that. Right. So the mm -hmm. things that help us to... Right actually, you know, feel a sense of purpose and connection. And now switching you said something, gears. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. You said something before that um, I have to highlight. Years ago when I worked in state government, it was very hard to get 
other people to come to the table. Everybody, I used to call it turfing down, is, <laughs> yeah, is my, but I have seen in the last couple of years where everybody's coming to the table and working because I think this thing is, is bigger than a bread box sure and is. I think everybody's realizing we all need to be part of it and help and um, I don't even know, like the viewers listening, what, what they can do um, to when they, you know, see something, say something, uh, or, do, or do something is, you know, you see it out there, kids with drugs, and, and I think, I have just seen, and maybe I'm sure it's Chittenden County's the same way, mm. everybody's pooling together because they know they can't do it by themselves, and that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, in lines of like restorative justice models that it really is the responsibility of all of us. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it's the responsibility of not like discriminating someone because they might have a criminal record. Right. Right. It's the responsibility of doctors not discriminating clients Employers, because they might have yeah. a past of addiction. And right. so they might treat them differently when they're talking about pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it's the responsibility of community members, of friends, of other people in schools to really right. support the families. Right. And to understand that everyone's human, and especially with the opiate addiction, why I think so many people are coming to the table is that it goes past a lot of our stereotypes of race and drugs, right. mm -hmm. so that we realize that there's no like wrong door into addiction, right. that it right. doesn't care who you are, or how much money you have, or what business you own, or what law degree you exactly. have. Exactly. And a lot of people end up addicted to opiates from a car accident or mm -hmm. pain. Right. So there's many different ways into this addiction that are very different from some other drugs we might yeah, see. And, and many of the, do the doctors that were here said it, it started with prescription. Prescription. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. They, that surprised me. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, I think, speaking of pharmaceuticals, um, but when these, these things were introduced, they said they were not addictive. It's sort of like cigarettes in the beginning. They're not addictive. Right. Wrong. Um, and so here we are. And I think, um, because I had an argument with them. I've said this before on another show. You know, that zero to ten? Right. They always pain ask scale. you, well, yeah. where's your pain scale? Well, you put the zero there. Does that, I'm expecting zero. And so they were giving you what you wanted. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. that's a problem. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. a problem. But I also think there's drugs elsewhere. Yes. They're everywhere mm -hmm. and in different forms. And I have a, I had a box in one of the shows that uh, came from Barry. I don't know if you've seen it. It's a display box of all the different types of drugs going back mm -hmm. like in oh, the 60s. It. Oh, it's, it's fascinating mm -hmm. because my mom was uh, LSD in, in, the, sure. in the 60s. That's what we, there's a little box there with LSD and all these other mm -hmm. things that were popular then. And you look at the paraphernalia and the, the different mm -hmm. forms they take. You know, and the, the candies and the uh, different things, it's mm -hmm. really... Well, and the big thing now, scary. like, n not to omit fentanyl, is the, is the Correct. main, really? is is the main problem right now with most overdose deaths Lethal. of heroin are because fentanyl is mixed in right. with it. So I do want to name that because okay. that yes, is the I, main, as the main right. cause of death. Right. Now that heroin. comes from the outside world, right, into, or is that in our... I mean, fentanyl is, is a pharmaceutical... Energy. Oh, a prescription yes, for correct. high pain. So if you're on certain oh, so treatments for cancer, it comes in patch form. You'll get patches and then, of fentanyl yeah. or oh, a fentanyl drip yep. in the hospital. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> and it, and it really has contributed to um, it's what kicks it up and over. Deaths. Does it really? It absolutely and so it's the does. combination of fentanyl with whatever it's And yes. people can't yes. necessarily mm -hmm. detect that there's fentanyl in, yeah. the, in the drug that they're buying and using. Huh. Um, and so they're mm -hmm. expecting to become intoxicated and right. to feel relief right. and it suppresses their breathing and right. their central nervous system and oh. they die. And then that's where the Narcan right. kicks in. Yes. Right. Right. And my husband just had surgery and they gave us Narcan to take home and just I was blown case. away. Yeah. Wow. Uh, we didn't, pr we didn't um, put the prescription in, but I said, I, I, you know, I don't want to, ex I'm expecting him to behave and not to do anything <laughs> foolish, but I guess they're thinking people will do that. That's great that they did that. I don't oh, know yeah, that, they were, I just, that they were prescribing yeah, that automatically now. Yeah, they just gave it to us. Yeah, they do. That's, that's wonderful. They, and they're actually that's encouraging yeah. people to, to just have, carry to have oh, right with them because yeah. you never right. know when you, but you have to know how to use it. But, and you can't keep right. it in your car. Yeah, right. Vermont. So <laughs> yeah, you can carry it around in your purse. Exactly. <laughs> Listen, we have just four minutes left and I, um, I just would like each one of you to sort of wrap up this crisis and 
and what you'd like to see going forward, what you need for help to help you do what you do. Well, I think that um, it's very important for um, people to be able to talk to their kids and not be afraid to bring this up um, with their kids. Um, I think adolescence is a time where um, people expect kids to be moody or right. oh, and they don't recognize change it. their behavior. And, right. and so sometimes I think it's, it's easy to write off changes in behavior due to people going through puberty, um, but also mm -hmm. to recognize if, if your kids are changing um, friends and starting to isolate more or be more secretive, um, it would be a really good time to try to talk to them or get some information. Um, there's a really good um, resource on the Department of Health website Great. called Parent Up mm -hmm. um, that has a lot of information for parents Great. and other people who are um, wanting to know more about how to yeah. talk to You've their kids. You've got a lot of good information on your website. Yeah, it's really, I've checked it out. Mary? Well, I think, I think we're definitely seeing in our region where we have, uh, we're working more as providers on that no wrong door piece mm -hmm. to, to really encourage all around the state that people work on that so that as, whether you're, going, whether you're a primary care provider or you're an emergency room doc or you're a mental health center or uh, a private clinician in the community that you become educated on where to send people for assistance so that you can provide them that information and get them there and into treatment really quickly. We're working on something called on-demand treatment right now so that even if someone comes in with an opiate addiction into our emergency room, we can actually do the screening. We're working on this piece to be able to start the treatment right there. Great. We're bringing in our recovery uh, uh, turning Point Recovery Center. Right. Um, we have peers that will transport people for further assessments over wow. to the uh, over to the um, substance use uh, assisted medication Great. center. Um, so and 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 further through our emergency screeners um, to treatment. You know, within Washington County Mental Health or Excellent. wherever else is needed. And our police are totally on mm. board with that. Yeah. Well, I will so say I that's think great here. I think that's that's great. the piece. Um, we've we've got to come together on this and work on that unified system. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, I would really just advocate to stay curious and, and to do research and try to stay out of judgment zone mm -hmm. and really acknowledge this is happening in Vermont. Sexual exploitation and human trafficking is happening in Vermont. And being willing to look at the issues and not hide them. And yeah. as we raise kids, raising them that feeling their feelings is okay and right. feeling upset and sad is okay and teaching them tools how to feel those mm -hmm. feelings so that they don't want to numb out right when they're adults oh, there's and when they're adolescents numb out yeah yeah, that's yeah. Sad. you know when the governor of Shumlin did his state of the state on drugs i sat there and i'm like what is he doing because mm -hmm. i think i live in a little bit of vacuum in my life and comes to turn, he was just exactly right. Yes. He said it at the right time, and he really um, created an awareness that we have a big problem in this state. Oh, mm -hmm. Thank you for tuning in. As you know, this is a, a series of one, uh, one video and a series of eight other videos on the crisis. And uh, stay tuned to ORCA, and we'll tell you all about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's Thank great. You. Excellent. Good job.